Section 17 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 17, The Murder. Balthasar, said the emperor, in pity of his friend's sullen face, I will send ye to Rome to make treaty with the Pope, since it goes so heavily with you to stay in Frankfurt. The margrave bit the ends of his yellow hair and made no answer. The empress half lay along the seat against the wall. On low stools near her sat her maidens sewing, three of them, embroidering between them a strip of scarlet silk. It was the dining hall, the table laid already with rudely magnificent covers. Nay, be pleasant with me, smiled the emperor. He laid his arm affectionately round the margrave's huge shoulders. Certes, since I took this resolution not to go to Rome, I have naught but sour looks from all save Hugh. Balthasar's good-humoured face cleared. Ye are wrong, my prince, but God what? I am not angered. We can manage without Rome. He heroically stifled his sigh. And who knows that ye may not change yet, he added cheerfully. Isabeau looked at them as they paced up and down, their arms about each other. Her husband seemed not to know of her presence, but the margrave was hotly conscious of her eyes upon him. And though he would not turn his upon her, nevertheless she marked it and in a half-smiling way came and leant on the table that divided them. "'Surely we are late to-night,' said the emperor. "'Yea,' answered Balthasar, "'I do not love to wait.' He stopped to pour himself a tankard of amber wine, and drank it at a draught. Isabeau watched him. "'Will not my lord also drink?' she asked. The fingers of her right hand were hidden in a cluster of red roses. With her left hand she raised a chaste flagon in which the sunlight burnt and sparkled. "'As you please, princess,' answered Malquar, and gazed towards the light indifferently. "'You might have poured for me,' murmured the margrave in a half-voice. Her hand came from the roses and touched a horn glass bound with silver. It lingered there a moment then rose to her bosom balthasar absorbing her face did not notice the gesture another time she answered i will serve you balthasar of courtraig she filled the glass until wine bubbled at the brim give it to my lord she said balthasar laughed uneasily their fingers touched upon the glass and a few drops were spilt take care cried the empress Melchor turned and took the goblet. Why did you say, take care? he asked. Between us we upset the wine, said Isabeau. Melchor drank. It has an ugly taste, he said. She laughed. Is it the cupbearer, perchance? The emperor drank again, then set it down. I say it is strange. Taste it, Balthasar. In an instant the empress intervened. Nay, she caught up the glass with a movement swifter than the margraves. Since I poured, the fault, if fault there be, is mine. Give it to me, cried Balthasar. But she made a quick motion aside. The glass slipped from her fingers and the wine was lost on the floor. As Balthasar stooped to pick up the goblet, the emperor smiled. I warn you of that flagon, Margrave. The pages and varlets entered with the meats and set them on the table. They who sat at the emperor's board came to take their places. Thierry followed his master and fixed quick eyes on the emperor. He knew that Melchor had been abroad all day at the hunt and could not have long returned. Hardly could their designs upon him be put in practice tonight. After the supper, he meant to speak to Hugh of Rousselary, this as an earnest of his final severance with Dirk. As the beautiful shining crowd settled to their seats, the young secretary, whose place was behind his master's chair, took occasion to note carefully 
the lord who was to receive his warning thierry marked the empress sitting languorously and stripping a red rose of its petals melchoir austere composed as always balthasar gay and noisy then he turned his gaze on hugh of rousselerie that noble sat close to the emperor thierry had not so far studied his personal appearance though acquainted with his reputation there was something in the turn of his features the prominent chin dark clear eyes pale complexion and resolute set of the mouth that gradually teased thierry as he gazed the whole expression reminded him of another face seen under different circumstances whose he could not determine suddenly the lord of rousselerie becoming aware of this scrutiny turned his singularly intent eyes in the direction of the young scholar at once thierry had it he placed the likeness in this manner had dirk ranswold often looked at him the resemblance was unmistakable if elusive this man's face was of necessity sterner darker older and more set he was of larger make moreover than dirk could ever be his nose was heavier his jaw more square yet the likeness once noticed could not be again overlooked it strangely discomposed thierry he felt he could not take his warning to one who had dirk's trick of the intense gaze and inscrutable set of the lips he considered if there were not someone else let him go straight away he thought to the emperor himself his reflections were interrupted by a little movement near the table a pause in the converse all eyes were turned to melchoir of brabant he leant back in his seat and stared before him as if he saw a sight of horror at the other end of the table he was quite pale his mouth open his lips strained and purplish the empress sprang up from beside him and caught his arm melchoir she shrieked Jesu, he does not hear me the emperor moved faintly like one struggling hopelessly under water melchoir the margrave pushed back his chair and seized his friend's cold hand do you not hear us will you not speak balthasar the emperor's voice came as if from depths of distance i am bewitched isabeau shrieked and beat her hands together melchoir sank forward while his face glistened with drops of agony he gave a low crying sound and fell across the table with an instantaneous movement of fright and horror the company rose from their seats and pressed towards the emperor but the margrave shouted at them stand back would you stifle him he is not dead nor god be thanked dying he lifted up the unconscious man and gazed eagerly into his face as he did so his own blanched despite his brave words melchoir's eyes and cheeks had fallen hollow a ghastly hue overspread his features his jaw dropped and his lips were cracked as if his breath burnt the blood we must take him hence said hugh of rousselerie with authority help me margrave he forced his way to balthasar's side the empress had fallen to her husband's feet a gleam of white and silver against the dark trappings of the throne what shall i do she moaned what shall i do the lord of rousselerie glanced at her fiercely cease to whine and bring hither a physician and a priest he commanded isabeau crouched away from him and her purple eyes blazed the margrave and hugh lifted the emperor between them there was a swaying confusion as chair and seats were pulled out lights swung higher and a passage forced through the bewildering crowd for the two nobles and their burden some 
flung open the door of the winding stairway that ascended to the emperor's bedchamber and slowly with difficulty melchoir of brabant was borne up the narrow steps isabeau rose to her feet and watched it she considered a moment then ran across the room and followed swiftly after the cumbrous procession it was now a quarter of an hour since the emperor had fainted and the hall was left empty only thierry remained staring about him with sick eyes he crossed to the emperor's seat where the gorgeous cushions were thrown to right and left in isabeau's place lay a single red rose half stripped of its leaves a great cluster of red roses on the floor beside it this was confirmation he did not think there was any other place in frankfort where grew such blooms so he was too late dirk might well defy him knowing that he would be too late his resolution was very quickly taken he would be utterly silent not by a word or a look would he betray what he knew since it would be useless what could save the emperor now it was one thing to give warning of evil projected another to reveal evil performed besides he told himself the empress and her faction would be at once in power dirk a high favorite he backed fearfully from the red roses glowing somberly by the empty throne and reflected eagerly on how this affected him and jacobia of martzburg to the man dying miserably above he gave no thought at all the woman who waited impatiently for her husband's death to put his friend in his place he did not consider nor did the fate of the kingship trouble him he pictured dirk as triumphant potent the close ally of the wicked empress and he shivered for his own treasured soul that he had just snatched from perdition he knew he could not fight nor face dirk triumphant armed with success and his outlook narrowed to the one idea let me get away but where martzburg would the chatelaine let him follow her it was too near Baal. he clasped his hands over his hot brow calling on jacobia as he dallied and trembled with his fears and terrors one entered the hall from the little door leading to the emperor's chamber hugh of Rousselary, holding a lamp a feverish feeling of guilt made thierry draw back the lord of Rousselary held up the lamp glanced down and along the empty seats then noticed the crimson flowers by isabeau's chair and picked them up as he raised his head his gray eyes caught thierry's glance ah the queen's chamberlain's scrivener he said do you chance to know how these roses came here nay answered thierry hastily i could not know they do not grow in the palace garden remarked hugh he laid them on the throne and walked the length of the table scrutinizing the dishes and goblets in the flare of flambeaux and candles there was no need for his lamp but he continued to hold it aloft as if he hoped it held some special power suddenly he stopped and called to thierry in his quiet commanding way the young man obeyed unwillingly look at that said hugh of Rousselary grimly he pointed to two small marks in the table black holes in the wood burns said thierry with pale lips from the candles lord candles do not burn in such a fashion as he spoke hugh came round the table and cast the lamplight over the shadowed floor what is that he bent down before the window thierry saw that he motioned to a great scar in the board as if fire had been flung and had bitten into the wood before extinguished the lord of Rousselary lifted a grim face i tell you the flames that made that mark are now burning the heart and blood out of melchoir of brabant do not say that do not speak so loud cried thierry desperately 
it cannot be true hugh set his lamp upon the table i am not afraid of the eastern witch he said sternly the man was my friend and she has bewitched and poisoned him now god hear me and you scrivener mark my vow if i do not publish this before the land a new hope rose in thierry's heart if this lord would denounce the empress before power was hers if her guilt could be brought home before all men yet through no means of his own why she and dirk might be defeated yet well he said hoarsely make haste lord for when the breath is out of the emperor it is too late she will have means to silence you and even now be careful she has many champions hugh of rousselerie smiled slowly you speak wisely scrivener and know i think something hereafter i shall question you thierry made a gesture for silence a heavy step sounded on the stair and balthasar pallid but still magnificent swept into the room a great war sword clattered after him he wore a gorget and carried his helmet his blue eyes were wild in his colorless face he gave hugh a look of some defiance melchoir is dying he said his tone rough with emotion and i must go look after the soldiery or some adventurer will seize the town dying repeated hugh who is with him the empress they have sent for the bishop until he come none is to enter the chamber by whose command by the order of the empress yet i will go the soldier paused at the doorway well ye were his friend belike she will let you in he swung away with a chink of steel belike she will not said hugh but i can make the endeavour with no further glance at the shuddering young man who held himself rigid against the wall hugh of rousselerie ascended to the emperor's chamber he found the anteroom crowded with courtiers and monks the emperor's door was closed and before it stood two black mutes brought by the empress from greece hugh touched a black-robed brother on the arm by what authority are we excluded from the emperor's deathbed several answered him the queen she claims to know as much of medicine as any of the physicians she is in possession hugh shouldered his way through them certes i must see him and her but not one stepped forward to aid or encourage melchoir was beyond protecting his adherents he was no longer emperor but a man who might be reckoned with the dead the empress and balthasar of courtraig had already seized the governance and who dared interfere the great nobles even held themselves in reserve and were silent but hugh of rousselerie's blood was up he had always held isabeau vile nor had he any love for the margrave whose masterful hand he saw in this since none of you will stand by me he cried speaking aloud to the throng i will by myself enter and by myself take the consequences he advanced to the door with his sword drawn and ready and the crowd drew back neither supporting nor preventing the slaves closed together and made a gesture warning him to retire he seized one by his gilt collar and swung him violently against the wall then while the other crouched in fear he opened the door and strode into the emperor's bedchamber it was a low room hung with gold and brown tapestry the windows were shut and the air faint the bed stood against the wall and the heavy dark curtains looped back revealed melchoir of brabant lying in his clothes on the coverlet with his throat bare and his eyes staring across the room a silver lamp stood on a table by the window and its faint radiance was the only light on the steps of the bed stood isabeau over her white dress she had flung a long scarlet cloak and her pale bright hair had fallen on to her shoulders 
at the sight of hugh she caught hold of the bed hangings and gazed at him fiercely he sheathed his sword as he came across the room princess i must see the emperor he said sternly he will see no man he knows none nor can he speak she answered her bearing prouder and more assured than he had ever known it get you gone sir i know not how ye forced an entry you have no power to keep the nobles from their lord he replied nor will i take your bidding i will have you put without the doors if you so disturb the dying but hugh of rousselary advanced to the bed let me see him he demanded he speaks to me the empress drew the curtain further concealing the dying man he speaks to none be gone as she spoke hugh sprang lightly and suddenly on to the steps pushed aside the slight figure of the empress and caught back the curtains melchoir he cried and snatched up the emperor by the shoulders he is dead breathed the empress with a slow step she went to the table and seated herself beside the silver lamp while she uttered sigh on sigh and clasped her hands over her eyes then the hot stillness began to quiver with the distant sound of numerous bells they were holding service for the dying in every church in frankfurt the emperor stirred in hugh's arms without opening his eyes he spoke pray for me balthazar they did not slay me honorably he raised his hands to his heart to his lips moaned and sank from hugh's arm to the pillow kia apud dominum misericordia et copiasa apudium he murmured iam redemptio flushed hugh amen moaned melchoir of brabant and so died for a moment the chamber was silent save for the insistent bells then Hugh turned his white face from the dead, and Isabeau shivered to her feet. Call in the others, murmured the Empress, since he is dead. Ay, I will call in the others, thou eastern witch, and show them the man thou hast murdered. She stared at him a moment, her face like a mask of ivory set in the glittering hair. Murdered, she said at last murdered he fingered his sword fiercely and it shall be my duty to see you brought to the stake for this night's work she gave a shriek and ran towards the door before she reached it it was flung open and balthasar of courtrai sprang into the room you called he panted his eyes blazing on hugh of rousselary yes he is dead Melchor is dead, and this lord says I slew him. Balthasar, answer for me. Certes, cried Hugh, a fitting one to speak for you, your accomplice. With a short sound of rage, the margrave dragged out his sword and struck the speaker a blow across the breast with the flat of it. So ho, he shouted, it pleases you to lie. He yelled to his men without, and the death chamber was filled with a clatter of arms that drowned the mournful peals of the bells. Take away this lord on my authority. Hugh drew his sword, only to have it wrenched away. The soldiers closed round him and swept their prisoner from the chamber, while Balthasar, flushed and furious, watched him dragged off. I always hated him, he said. Isabel fell on her knees and kissed his mailed feet. Melchor is dead, and I have no champion save you. The margrave stooped and raised her, his face burning with blushes till it was like a great rose. Isabel, Isabel, he stammered. She struggled out of his arms. Nay, not now, she whispered in a stifled voice. Not now can I speak to you but afterwards my lord my lord she went to the bed and flung herself across the steps her face hidden in her hands balthasar took off his helmet 
crossed himself and humbly bent his great head melchoir the fourth lay stiffly on the lily sewn coverlet and without the great bells tolled and the monk's chant rose de profundis end of section 17 recording by molly craig section 18 of black magic by marjorie bowen this librivox recording is in the public domain part 1 chapter 18 the pursuit of jacobia the chatelaine of martzburg sat in the best guest chamber of a wayside hostel that lay a few hours journeying from her home so swiftly had she fled from frankfort that its last scenes were still before her eyes like a gorgeous and disjointed pageant the emperor stricken down at the feast the brief flashing turmoil isabeau's peerless face that her own horrid thoughts colored with a sinister expression balthasar of courtraig bringing the city to his feet hugh of rousselary snatched away to a dungeon and over it all the leaping red light of a hundred flambeaux presently she passed into the little bedchamber and took up a mirror into which she gazed long and earnestly is it a wicked face she answered herself no no is it a weak face alas the wind rose higher fluttered the lamp flame and stirred the arras on the wall and laying the mirror down she returned to the outer chamber up and down walked jacobia of martzburg clasping and unclasping her soft young hands her gray eyes turning from right to left she wished she had asked for a fire and that she had kept one of the women to sleep with her it was so lonely she wanted to go to the door and call someone but a curious heaviness in her limbs began to make movement irksome she could no longer drag her steps, and with a sigh she sank into the frayed velvet chair by the fireplace. She tried to tell herself that she was free, that she was on her way to escape, but could not form the words on her lips, hardly the thought. Her head throbbed, and a cold sensation gripped her heart. She moved in the chair, only to feel as if held down in it, she struggled in vain to rise barbara she whispered and thought she was calling aloud her brain whirled with memories with anticipations and vague expectations tinged with fear like the sensations of a dream she felt that she was sinking into soft infolding darkness the lamp flame changed into a five-pointed star that rested on a knight's helm the sound of wind and rain became faint human cries she whispered as the dying emperor had done i am bewitched then the knight with the star glittering above his brow came towards her and offered her a goblet sebastian she cried and sat up with a face of horror the chamber was spinning about her she saw the knight's long painted shield and his bare hand holding out the wine his visor was down she shrieked and laughed together and put the goblet aside some one spoke out of the mystery the empress found happiness why not you may not a woman die as easily as a man she tried to remember her prayers to find her crucifix but the cold edge of the gold touched her lips and she drank the hot wine scorched her throat and filled her with strength as she sprang up the night star quivered back into the lamp flame the vapors cleared from the room she found herself staring at dirk renswode who stood in the center of the room and smiled at her oh she cried in a bewildered way and put her hands to her forehead well said dirk he held a rich gold goblet empty and his was the voice she had already heard 
Why did you leave Frankfurt? Jacobia shuddered. I, I do not know. Her eyes were blank and dull. I think I was afraid. Lest you might do as Isabeau did? asked Dirk. What has happened to me? was all her answer. What of your steward? whispered Dirk. I have no steward. I am going alone to Martzburg. Dirk set the goblet beside the lamp. The while he watched her intently with frowning eyes. What of Sebastian? he repeated. Ye fled from him. But have ye ceased to think of him? No, said the Chatelaine of Bartsburg. No, day and night. What is God that he lets a man's face to come between me and him? The emperor is dead, said Dirk. Is dead, she repeated. Isabeau knows how. Ah, she whispered, I, I think I knew it. Shall the empress be happy and you starve your heart to death? Jacobia sighed. Sebastian, Sebastian, she had the look of one walking in sleep. What is Sibylla to you? His wife, answered Jacobia in the same tone. His wife. The dead do not bind the living. Jacobia laughed. No, no, how cold it is here. Do you not feel the wind across the floor? Her fingers wandered aimlessly over her bosom. Sibylla is dead, you say. Nay, Sibylla might die. So easily. Jacobia laughed again. I Isabeau did it. She is young and fair, she said. And she could do it. Why not I? But I cannot bear to look on death. Her expressionless eyes turned on Dirk still in sightless fashion. A word, said Dirk, that is all your part. Send him ahead to Martzburg. Jacobia nodded aimlessly. Why not? Why not? Sibylla would be in bed, lying awake, listening to the wind as I have done, so often, and he would come up the steep, dark stairs, Oh, and she would raise her head. Dirk put in. Has the Chatelaine spoken? She would say, and he would make an end of it. Perhaps she would be glad to die, said Jacobia dreamily. I have thought that I should be glad to die. And Sebastian, said Dirk. Her strangely altered face lit and changed. Does he care for me? she asked piteously. Enough to make life and death of little moment, answered Dirk. Has he not followed you from Frankfurt? Followed me, murmured Jacobia. I thought he had forsaken me. Sebastian, said Dirk softly. He waved his little hand, and the steward appeared in the dark doorway of the inner room. He looked from one to the other swiftly, and his face was flushed and dangerous. Sebastian, said Jacobia, there was no change in voice nor countenance. He came across the room to her, speaking as he came, but a sudden fresh gust of wind without scattered his words. Have you followed me? she asked. Yea, he answered hoarsely, staring at her. He had not dreamed a living face could look so white as hers. No, nor dead face either. He dropped to one knee before her and took her limp hand. She bent forward, and with her other hand touched his tumbling hair. Lord of Martzburg, and my lord, she said, and smiled sweetly. Do you know how much I love you, Sebastian? Why, you must ask the image of the Virgin. I have told her so often, and no one else, nay, no one else. Sebastian sprang to his feet. Oh, God, he cried, I am ashamed. Ye have bewitched her. She knows not what she says. Dirk turned on him fiercely. Did ye not curse me when ye thought she had escaped? Did I not swear to recover her for you? Is she not yours? St. Gabriel cannot save her now. If she had not said that, muttered Sebastian, he turned distracted eyes upon her standing with no change in her expression, the tips of her fingers resting on the table, 
her wide grey eyes gazing before her fool answered dirk and she did not love you what chance had you i left my fortunes to help you to this prize and i will not see you palter now lady speak to him ay speak to me cried sebastian earnestly tell me if it be your wish that i at all costs should become your husband tell me if it is your will that the woman in our way should go a slow passion stirred the calm of her face her eyes glittered yes she said yes jacobia he took her arm and drew her close to him look me in the face and repeat that to me think if it is worth hell to you and me she gazed up at him then hid her face on his sleeve ay hell she answered heavily go to martzburg to-night she cannot claim you when she is dead how i have striven not to hate her my lord my husband he put her from him into the worn old chair i will come back to you to-morrow the wind rushed between them and made the lamp flame leap wildly make haste cried dirk away the horse is below sebastian opened the door on to the dark stairway and went softly out now it is done murmured dirk in a swelling whisper and she is lost he snatched up the lamp and holding it aloft looked down at the drooping figure in the chair jacobia's head sank back against the tarnished velvet there was a smile on her white lips and her hand rested in her lap even with dirk's intent face bending over her and the full light pouring down on her she did not look up gold hair and grey eyes and her little feet murmured dirk one of god's own flowers what are you now jacobia moved in her seat is he gone she asked fearfully certes he has gone smiled dirk would you have him dally on such an errand jacobia rose swiftly and stood a moment listening to the unhappy wind i thought he was here she said under her breath i thought that he had come at last he came said dirk the chatelaine looked swiftly round at him there was a dawning knowledge in her eyes who are you she demanded and her voice had lost its calm what has happened do you not remember me smiled dirk jacobia staggered back why she stammered he was here down at my feet and we spoke about sibylla and now said dirk he is gone to free you of sibylla as you bid him as i bid him at this moment he rides to martzburg on this service of yours and i must be gone to frankfort where my fortunes wait for you these words should you meet again one thierry a pretty scholar do not prate to him of god and judgment nor try to act the saint let him alone he is no matter of yours and maybe some woman cares for him as ye care for sebastian ay and will hold him though she have not yellow hair you are the devil she shrieked i have delivered myself unto the devil she beat her hands together and fell towards his feet dirk stepped close and peered curiously into her unconscious face why she is not so fair he murmured and grief will spoil her bloom and twas only her face he loved he extinguished the lamp and smiled into the darkness he drew the curtain away from the deep-set window and the moon riding the storm clouds like a silver armored amazon cast a ghastly light over the huddled figure of jacobia of martzburg and threw her shadow dark and trailing across the cold floor dirk left the chamber and the hostel unseen and unheard the wind made too great a clamor for stray sounds to tell out in the wild wet night he paused a moment to get his bearings then turned towards the shed where he and sebastian had left their horses 
there were the chatelaine's horses asleep in their stalls here was his own but the place beside it where sebastian's steed had waited was empty dirk shivering a little in the tempest unfastened his horse and was prepared to depart when a near sound arrested him some one was moving in the straw at the back of the shed dirk listened his hand on the bridle till a moonbeam striking across his shoulder revealed a cloaked figure rising from the ground the stranger got to his feet i have but taken shelter here sir he said deeming it too late to rouse the hostel thierry cried dirk and laughed excitedly now this is strange the figure came forward thierry yes have you followed me he exclaimed wildly and his face showed drawn and wan in the silver light i left frankfort to escape you what fiend's trick has brought you here are you afraid of me thierry dirk asked mournfully certes there is no need but thierry cried out at him with the fierceness of one at bay be gone i want none of you nor of your kind i know how the emperor died and i fled from a city where such as you came to power ay even as jacobia of martzburg did i am come after her and where think you to find her asked dirk by now she is at baal are ye not afraid to go to baal thierry trembled and stepped back into the shadows of the shed i want to save my soul no i am not afraid if need be i will confess dirk laughed at the shrine of jacobia of martzburg look to it she be not trampled in the mire by then you lie you malign her cried the other in strong agitation but dirk turned on him with imperious sternness i did not leave frankfort on a fool's errand i was triumphant at the high tide of my fortunes my foot on isabeau's neck i had good reason to have left this alone come with me to martzburg and see my work and know the saint you worship is the chatelaine there if not yet she will be soon take one of these horses he added i know not your meaning answered thierry fearfully but my road was to martzburg i mean to pray jacobia who left without a word to me to give me some small place in her service belike she will mocked dirk impatiently and feverishly thierry unfastened and prepared himself a mount if ye have evil designs on her he cried be very sure ye will be defeated for her strength is as the strength of angels dirk delicately guided his steed out of the shed the moon had at last conquered the cloud battalions and a clear cold light revealed the square dark shape of the hostel the flapping sign the bare pine trees and the long glimmer of the road dirk's eyes turned to the blank window of the room where jacobia lay and he smiled wickedly the night has cleared he said as thierry leading one of the chatelaine's horses came out of the stable and we should reach martzburg before the dawn end of section eighteen recording by molly craig Section 19 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 19, Sibylla. Sebastian paused on the steep dark stairs and listened. Castle Martzburg was utterly silent. He knew that there were one or two servants only within the walls and that they slept at a distance he knew that his cautious entry by the donjon door had made no sound yet on every other step or so he stood still and listened he had procured a light it fluttered in danger of extinction in the draughty stairway and he had to shield it with his hand once when he stopped he took from his belt the keys that had gained him admission and slipped them into the bosom of his doublet 
hanging at his waist they made a little jingling sound as he moved when he gained the great hall he opened the door as softly and slowly as if he did not know emptiness alone awaited him the other side he entered and his little light only served to show the expanses of gloom it was very cold he could hear the rain falling in a thin stream from the lips of the gargoyles without he remembered that same sound on the night the two students took shelter the night when the deed he was about to do had by a devil in a whisper been first put into his head he crossed to the hearth and set the lamp in the niche by the chimney-piece he wished there was a fire certainly it was cold the dim rays of the lamp showed the ashes on the hearth the cushions in the window-seat and something that even in that dullness shone with fiery hue sebastian looked at it in a half horror it was sibylla's red lily finished and glowing from a samite cushion by the side of it slept jacobia's little grey cat the steward gazing in curiously intent fashion recalled the fact that he had never conversed with his wife and never liked her he could not tell of one sharp word between them yet had she said she hated him he would have felt no surprise he wondered in case he had ever loved her would he have been here to-night on this errand lord of martzburg lord of as fine a domain as any in the empire with the chance of the imperial crown itself nay had he loved his wife it would have made no difference what sorry fool even would let a woman interfere with a great destiny lord of martzburg with little reflection on the inevitable for his wife he fell to considering jacobia until to-night she had been a cipher to him that she favoured him a mere voucher for his crime for the procuring of this or that for him a fact to be accepted and used but that she should pray about him speak as she had that was another matter and for the first time in his cold life he was both moved and ashamed his thin dark face flushed he looked askance at the red lily and took the light from its niche the shadows seemed to gather and throng out of the silence bearing down on him and urging him forward he found the little door by the fireplace open and ascended the steep stone stairs to his wife's room here there was not even the drip of the rain or the wail of the wind to disturb the stillness he had taken off his boots and his silk-clad feet made no sound but he could not hush the catch of his breath and the steady thump of his heart when he reached her room he paused again and again listened nothing how could there be had he not come so softly even the little cat had slept on undisturbed he opened the door and stepped in it was a small low chamber the windows were unshrouded and fitful moonlight played upon the floor sebastian looked at once towards the bed that stood to his left it was hung with dark arras now drawn back from the pillows sibylla was asleep her thick heavy hair lay outspread under her cheek her flesh and the bedclothes were turned to one dazzling whiteness by the moon worked into the coverlet that had slipped half to the polished floor were great wreaths of purple roses showing dim yet gorgeous her shoes stood on the bed steps her clothes were flung over a chair near by a crucifix hung against the wall with her breviary on a shelf beneath the passing storm clouds cast luminous shadows across the chamber but they were becoming fainter the tempest was dying away sebastian put the lamp on a low coffer inside the door and advanced to the bed a large dusky mirror hung beside the window and in it he could see his wife again reflected dimly in her ivory whiteness with the dark lines of her hair and brows he came to the bedside so that his shadow was flung across her sleeping face sibylla he said her regular breathing did not change sibylla now she stirred 
he heard her fetch a sigh as one who wakens reluctantly from soft dreams do you not hear me speak sibylla from the bewildering glooms of the bed he heard her silk bedclothes rustle and slip the moon came forth again and revealed her sitting up wide awake now and staring at him so you have come home sebastian she said why did you rouse me he looked at her in silence she shook back her hair from her eyes what is it she asked softly the emperor died said sebastian i know what is that to me bring the light sebastian i cannot see your face there is no need the emperor had not time to pray and i would not deal so with you therefore i woke you sebastian by my mistress's commands you must die to-night and by my desire i shall be lord of martzburg and there is no other way she put her hand to her long throat i wondered if you would ever say this to me i did not think so for it did not enter my mind that she could give commands then you knew sibylla smiled before ever you did sebastian and i have so thought of it in these long days when i have been alone it seemed that i must sew it even into my embroidering jacobia loves sebastian he gripped the bedpost i am not here to talk of that answered sebastian nor have we long the dawn is not far off sibylla rose letting her long feet on the bedstep so i must die she said must die certes i have not lived so ill that i should fear to die nor so pleasantly that i should yearn to live it will be a poor thing in you to kill me but no shame to me to be slain my lord as she stood now against the shadowed curtains her hair caught the lamplight and flashed into red gold about her colourless face sebastian looked at her with hatred and some terror but she smiled strangely at him you never knew me sebastian but i am very well acquainted with you and i do scorn you so utterly that i am sorry for the chatelaine she and i will manage that answered sebastian fiercely and if you seek to divert or delay me by this talk it is useless for i am resolved nor will i be moved she moved from the bed in the long linen garment that she wore slim and childish to see she took a wrap of gold-coloured silk from a chair and put it about her the man gazed at her the while with sullen eyes she glanced at the crucifix i have nothing to say god knows it all i am ready i do not want your soul he cried sibylla smiled i made confession yesterday how cold it is for this time of year i do not shiver for fear my lord make haste breathed sebastian his wife raised her face how long have we been wed she asked let that be he paled and bit his lip three years nay not three years when i am dead give my embroideries to jacobia they are in these coffers i have finished the red lily i was sewing it when the two scholars came that night she first knew and you first knew but i had known a long while sebastian caught up the lamp be silent or speak to god he said she came gently across the floor holding the yellow silk at her breast what are you going to do with me she whispered strangle me nay they would see that afterwards sebastian went to a little door that opened beside the bed and pulled aside the arras that leads to the battlements she said he pointed to the dark steps go up sibylla he held the lamp above his haggard face and the light of it fell over the narrow winding stone steps she looked at them and ascended sebastian followed closing the door after him in a few moments they were out on the donjon roof the vast stretch of sky was clear now and paling for the dawn faint pale clouds clustered round the dying moon and the scattered stars pulsed wearily below them lay the dark masses of the other portions of the castle and beside them rose the straining pole and wind-tattered banner of jacobia of martzburg sibylla leant against the battlements 
her hair fluttering over her face how cold it is she said in a trembling voice make haste my lord he was shuddering too in the keen insistent wind will you not pray he asked again no she answered and looked at him vacantly if i shriek would any one hear me will it be more horrible than i thought make haste make haste or i shall be afraid she crouched against the stone shivering violently sebastian put the lamp upon the ground take care it does not go out she said and laughed <laughs> you would not like to find your way back in the dark the little cat will be sorry for me she broke off to watch what he was doing a portion of the tower projected here the wall was of a man's height and pierced with arblast holes through there sibylla had often looked and seen the country below framed in the stone like a picture in a letter of an aura so small it seemed and yet clear and brightly colored beneath the wall was a paving stone raised at will by an iron ring when lifted it revealed a sheer open drop the entire height of the donjon through which stones and fire could be hurled in time of siege upon the assailants in the courtyard below but jacobia had always shuddered at it nor had there been occasion to open it for many years sibylla saw her husband strain at the ring and bend over the hole and step forward must it be that way oh hey sue hey sue shall i not be afraid she clasped her hands and fixed her eyes on the figure of sebastian as he raised the slab and revealed the black aperture quickly he stepped back as stone rang on stone so he said i shall not touch you and it will be swiftly over walk across sibylla she closed her eyes and drew a long breath have you not the courage he cried violently then i must hurl you from the battlements it shall not look like murder she turned her face to the beautiful brightening sky my soul is not afraid but how my body shrinks i do not think i can do it he made a movement towards her at that she gathered herself no you shall not touch me across the donjon roof she walked with a firm step farewell sebastian may god assoil me and thee she put her hands to her face and moaned as her foot touched the edge of the hole no shriek nor cry disturbed the serenity of the night she made no last effort to save herself but disappeared silently to the blackness of her death sebastian listened to the strange indefinite sound of it and drops of terror gathered on his brow then all was silent again save for the monotonous flap of the banner lord of martzburg he muttered to steady himself lord of martzburg he dropped the stone into place picked up the lantern and returned down the close cold stairs her room on the pillow the mark where her head had lain her clothes over the coffer well he hated her no less than he had ever done to the last she had shamed him why had he been so long too long soon someone would be stirring and he must be far from martzburg before they found sibylla he crept from the chamber with the same unnecessary stealth he had observed in entering and in a cautious manner descended the stairs to the great hall the pale glow of a dreary dawn filled the great hall as he entered it the gray cat was still asleep and the shining silks of the red lily shone like the hair of the strange woman who had worked it patiently into the samite he tiptoed across the hall descended the wider stairs and made his way to the first chamber of the donjon carefully he returned the lamp to the niche where he had found it wondering as he extinguished it if any would note that it had been burnt that night carefully he drew on his great muddy boots and crept out by the little postern door into the court so sheltered was the castle and situated in so peaceful a place that when the chatelaine was not within the walls 
the huge outer gates that required many men to close them stood open on to the hillside beyond them sebastian saw his patient horse fastened to the ring of the bell chain and beyond him the clear grey-blue hills and trees his road lay open yet he closed the door slowly behind him and hesitated he strove with a desire to go and look at her he knew just how she had fallen when he had first come to martzburg the hideous hole in the battlements exercised a great fascination over him he had often flung down stones clods of grass and even once a book that he might hear the hollow whistling sound and imagine a furious enemy below afterwards he had noticed these things and how they struck the bottom of the shaft lying where she would be now he desired to see her yet loathed the thought of it there was his horse there the open road and jacobia waiting a few miles away yet he must linger while the accusing daylight gathered about him while the rising sun discovered him he must dally with the precious moments bite the ends of his black hair frown and stare at the round tower of the donjon the other side of which she lay at last he crossed the rough cobbles skirted the keep and stood still looking at her yes he had pictured her yet he saw her more distinctly than he had imagined he would in this grey light her hair and her cloak seemed to be wrapped close about her one hand still clung to her face her feet showed bare and beautiful sebastian crept nearer he wanted to see her face and if her eyes were open to be certain also if that dark red that lay spread on the ground was all her scattered locks the light was treacherous he was stooping to touch her when the quick sound of an approaching horseman made him draw back and glance round but before he could even tell himself it were well to fly they were upon him two horsemen finely mounted the foremost dirk renswode bareheaded a rich colour in his cheek and a sparkle in his eye he reined up the slim brown horse so it is done he cried leaning from the saddle towards sebastian the steward stepped back whom have you with you he asked in a shaking voice a friend of mine and a suitor to the chatelaine of which folly you and i shall cure him thierry pressed forward the hoofs of his striving horse making musical clatter on the cobbles the steward he cried and his voice sank he turned burning eyes on dirk the steward's wife that was smiled the youth but certes you must do him worship now he will be lord of martzburg sebastian was staring at sibylla you tell too much he muttered nay my friend is one with me and i can answer for his silence dirk patted the horse's neck and laughed again laughter with a high triumphant note in it thierry swung round on him in a desperate bitter fierceness why have you brought me here where is the chatelaine by god his saints that woman has been murdered dirk turned in the saddle and faced him a and by jacobia of martzburg's commands thierry laughed aloud the lie is dead as you give it being he answered nor can all your devilry make it live sebastian said dirk has not this woman come to her death by the chatelaine's commands he pointed to sibylla you know it since in your presence she bade me hither answered sebastian heavily dirk's voice rose clear and musical you see your piece of uprightness thought highly of her steward and that she might endow him with her hand his wife must die peace peace cried sebastian fiercely and thierry rose in his saddle it is a lie he repeated wildly if tis not a lie god has turned his face from me and i am lost indeed if tis no lie cried dirk exultingly you are mine did ye not swear it and she be this thing you name her answered thierry passionately 
then the devil is cunning indeed and i his servant but if you speak false i will kill you at her feet and by that will i abide smiled dirk sebastian you shall return with us to give this news to your mistress is she not here cried thierry dirk pointed to the silver-plated harness you ride her horse see her arms upon his breast sweet fool we left her behind in the hostel waiting the steward's return always ye trap and deceive me exclaimed thierry hotly let us be gone said sebastian he looked at dirk as if at his master is it not time for us to be gone it was full daylight now though the sun had not yet risen above the hills the lofty walls and high towers of the huge gray castle blocked up the sky and threw into the gloom the three in their shadow hark said dirk and lifted his finger delicately a white horse appeared against the cold misty background of the gray country a woman was in the saddle jacobia of martzburg she paused peered up at the high little windows in the donjon then turned her gaze on the silent three now can the chatelaine speak for herself breathed dirk thierry gave a great sigh his eyes fixed with a painful intensity on the approaching lady but she did not seem to see either of them sebastian she cried and drew rein gazing at him where is your wife her words rang on the cold clear air like strokes of a bell sibylla died last night answered the steward but i did not and you should not have come jacobia shaded her brows with her gloved hand and stared past the speaker what is that on the ground she cried sibylla he has slain sibylla but sirs she looked round her distractedly ye must not blame him he saw my wish from your own lips cried thierry who are you who speak she demanded haughtily i sent him to slay sibylla she interrupted herself with a hideous shriek sebastian ye are stepping in her blood and letting go of the reins she sank from the saddle the steward caught her and as she slipped from his hold to her knees her unconscious head came near to the stiff white feet of the dead her yellow hair cried dirk let us leave her to her steward you and i have another way may god curse her as he has me said thierry in an agony for she has slain my hope of heaven you will not leave me called sebastian what shall i say what shall i do lie and lie again answered dirk with a wild air wed the dame and damn her people let fly your authority and break her heart as quickly as you may amen to that added thierry and now to frankfort cried dirk exultant they set their horses to a furious pace and galloped out of castle martzburg end of section nineteen recording by molly craig section twenty of black magic by marjorie bowen this librivox recording is in the public domain part one chapter twenty hugh of Rousselary. dirk took off his riding coat and listened with a smile to the quick step of thierry overhead he was again in the long low chamber looking out on the witch's garden and nothing was changed save that the roses bloomed no longer on the bare thorny bushes so you have brought him back said natalie caressing the youth's soft sleeve pulled his saint out of her shrine and given her over to the demons dirk turned his head a beautiful look was in his eyes yea i have brought him back he said musingly you have done a foolish thing grumbled the witch he will ruin you yet beware for even now you hold him against his will i marked his face as he went into the chamber dirk seated himself with a sigh in this matter i am not to be moved and now some food for i am so weary that i can scarcely think natalie the toll it has been 
the rough roads, the delays, the long hours in the saddle, but it was worth it. The witch set the table with a rich service of ivory and silver. Worth leaving your fortunes at the crisis. Ye left Frankfurt the day after the emperor died, and have been away two months. Isabeau thinks you dead. Dirk frowned. No matter. Tomorrow she shall know me living. Martsburg is far away, and the weather delayed us, but it had to be. Now I am free to work my own advancement. He drank eagerly of the wine put before him, and began to eat. "'Ye have heard,' asked Natalie, "'that Balthasar of Courtraig has been elected emperor?' "'Yea,' smiled Dirk, "'and is to marry Isabeau within the year. "'We knew it, did we not? "'Next spring they will go to Rome "'to receive the imperial crown. "'I shall be with them,' said Dirk. "'Well, it is good to rest. "'What a thick fool Balthasar is,' he smiled, "'and his eyes sparkled. The Empress is a clever woman, answered the witch. She came here once to know whither you had gone. I told her, for the jest, that you were dead. At that she must think her secret dead with you, yet she gave no sign of joy nor relief, nor any hint of what her business was. She is never betrayed by her puppet's face. An iron-hearted fiend, the Empress. They say, though, that she is a fool for Balthasar, a dog at his heels. Until she change. Be like, you will be her next fancy, said Natalie. The crystals always foretell a throne for you. Dirk laughed. I do not mean to share my honors with any woman, he answered. Pile up the fire, Natalie. Certes, it is cold. He pushed back his chair with a half sigh on his lips and turned contented eyes on the glowing hearth Natalie replenished. "'And none has thought evil of Melchor's death?' he asked curiously. "'Eh, there was Hugh of Rousselerie.' Dirk sat up. "'The Lord of Rousselerie?' "'Certes, the night Melchor died, he flung murderous in the Empress's face.' Dirk showed a grave, alert face. "'I never heard of that.' "'Nay.' answered the witch with some malice ye were too well engaged in parting that boy from his love it is a pretty jest certainly she is a clever woman she enlists balthasar as her champion he becomes enraged furious and hugh is cast into the dungeons for his pains the witch laughed softly <laughs> he would not retract his case swayed to and fro but Balthasar and the Empress always hated him. He had never a chance. Dirk rose and pressed his clasped hands to his temple. What do you say? Never a chance? He is to die tonight at sunset. He must not die. He on the scaffold? I, as you say, was following that boy and his love while this was happening? The witch fell back against the wall, while overhead the restless tread of Thierry sounded. Dirk dashed from the room and out into the quiet street. For a second he paused. It was late afternoon. He had perhaps an hour or an hour and a half. Clenching his hands, he drew a deep breath and turned in the direction of the palace at a steady run. By reason of the snow clouds and bitter cold, there were few abroad to notice the slim figure running swiftly and lightly. Those who were about made their way in the direction of the marketplace, where the lord of Rousselerie was presently to meet his death. Dirk arrived at the palace, one hand over his heart, stinging him with the pain of his great speed. He demanded the empress. None among the guards knew either him or his name, but at his imperious insistence they sent word by a page to Isabeau that the young doctor Constantine had a desire to see her. The boy returned, and Dirk was admitted instantly, smiling gloomily to think with what feelings Isabeau would look on him. So far all had been swiftly accomplished. He was conducted to her private chamber, and brought face to face with her while he still panted from his running. 
until the page had gone neither spoke then dirk said quickly i returned to frankfort to-day isabeau was agitated to fear by his sudden appearance where have you been she asked i thought you dead i have no time for speech with you now you owe me something do you not well i am here to ask part payment the empress winced well what i had no wish to be ungrateful twas you avoided me she crossed to the hearth and fixed her superb eyes intently on the youth hugh of rousselary is to die this evening he said yea answered isabeau and her childish loveliness darkened for a while dirk was silent he showed suddenly frail and ill on his face was an expression of emotion mastered and held back he must not die he said at last and lifted his eyes shadowed with fatigue that is what i demand of you his pardon now and at once we have but little time isabeau surveyed him curiously and fearfully you ask too much she replied in a low tone do you know why this man is to die for speaking the truth he said with a sudden sneer the empress flushed and clutched the embroidery on her bodice you of all men should know why he must be silenced she retorted bitterly what is your reason for asking his life dirk's mouth took on an ugly curl my reason is no matter it is my will have i made you so much my master she muttered the young man answered impatiently you will give me his pardon and make haste for i must ride with it to the market-place i think i will not i am not so afraid of you and i hate this man my secret is your secret after all dirk gave a wan smile i can blast you as i blasted melchoir of brabant isabeau and do you think i have any fear of what you can say but he leaned towards her suppose i go with what i know to balthasar the name humbled the empress like a whip held over her so i am helpless she muttered loathing him the pardon insisted dirk sound the bell and write me a pardon still she hesitated it was a hard thing to lose her vengeance against a dangerous enemy choose another reward she pleaded of what value can this man's life be to you you seek to put me off until it be too late cried dirk hoarsely he stepped forward and seized the handbell on the table now and you show yourself obstinate i go straight from here to balthasar and tell him of the poisoning of melchoir instinct and desire rose in isabeau to defy him with everything in her possession from her guards to her nails she shuddered with suppressed wrath and pressed her little clenched hands against the wall her chamberlain entered write out a pardon for the lord of rousselary commanded dirk and haste as you love your place when the man had gone isabeau turned with an ill-conceived savagery what will they think what will balthasar think that must be your business said dirk wearily and hugh himself flashed the empress the youth colored painfully let him be sent to his castle in flanders he said with averted face he must not remain here so much you give in cried isabeau i do not understand you he responded with a wild look no one will ever understand me isabeau the chamberlain returned and in a shaking hand the empress took the parchment and the reed pen while dirk waved the man's dismissal sign he cried to her isabeau set the parchment on the table and looked out at the gathering clouds the lord of rousselary must have already left the prison she dallied with the pen then took a little dagger from her hair and sharpened it dirk read her purpose in her lovely evil eyes and snatched the lingering right hand into his own long fingers 
the empress drew together and looked up at him bitterly and darkly but dirk's breath stirred the ringlets that touched her cheek his cool grip guided her reluctant pen she shivered with fear and defiance she wrote her name dirk flung her hand aside with a great sigh of relief do not try to foil me again morosia porphyrogenitis he cried and caught up the parchment his hat and cloak she watched him leave the room heard the heavy door close behind him and she writhed with rage thrusting with an uncontrollable gesture of passion the dagger into the table it quivered in the wood and then broke under her hand with an ugly cry she ran to the window flung it open and cast the handle out when it rattled on the cobbled yard dirk was already there he marked it fall knew the gold and red flash and smiled showing the parchment signed by the empress he had commanded the swiftest horse in the stables the market-place lay at the other end of the town and the hour for the execution was close at hand but the white horse he rode was fresh and strong the thick gray clouds had obscured the sunset and covered the sky a few trembling flakes of snow fell a bitter wind blew between the high narrow houses here and there a light sparkling in a window emphasized the colorless cold without dirk urged the steed till he rocked in the saddle he passed the high walls of the college galloped over the bridge that crossed the sullen waters of the main swept by the open doors of st wolfram then had to draw rein for the narrow street began to be choked with people he pulled his hat over his eyes and flung his cloak across the lower half of his face with one hand he dragged on the bridle with the other waved the parchment a pardon he cried a pardon make way they drew aside before the plunging steed some answered him it is no pardon he wears not the empress's livery one seized his bridle dirk leant from the saddle and dashed the parchment into the fellow's face the horse snorted and plunging cleared away and gained the market-place here the press was enormous men women and children were gathered close round the mounted soldiers who guarded the scaffold the armor yellow and blue uniforms and bright feathers of the horsemen showed vividly against the gray houses and grayer sky on the scaffold were two dark graceful figures a man kneeling with his long throat bare and a man standing with a double-edged sword in his hands a pardon shrieked dirk in the name of the emperor he was wedged in the crowd who made bewildered movements but could not give place to him the soldiers did not or would not hear dirk rose desperately in his stirrups as he did so the hat and cloak fell back and his head and shoulders were revealed clearly above the swaying mass hugh of rousselary heard the cry looked across the crowd and his eyes met the eyes of dirk renswode a pardon cried dirk hoarsely he saw the condemned man's lips move the sword fell a woman screamed said the monk on the scaffold and proclaimed a pardon and he pointed to the commotion gathered about dirk while the executioner displayed to the crowd the serene head of hugh of rousselary nay it was not a woman one of the soldiers answered the monk twas this youth dirk forced to the foot of the scaffold let me through he said in a terrible voice the guard parted and seeing the parchment in his hand let him mount the steps you bring a pardon whispered the monk i am too late said dirk he stood among the hurrying blood that stained the platform and his face was hard dogs and this an end for a lord of rousselary he cried and clasped his hand on a straining breast could you not have waited a little but a few moments more the snow was falling fast it lay on dirk's shoulders and on his smooth hair the monk drew the parchment from his passive hand and read it in a whisper to the officer they both looked askance at the young man give me his head said dirk 
the executioner had placed it at a corner of the scaffold he left off wiping his sword and brought it forward dirk watched without fear or repulsion and took hugh's head in his slim fair hands how heavy it is he whispered the quick distortion of death had left the proud features dirk held the face close to his own with no heed to the blood that trickled down his doublet priest and captain standing apart noticed a horrible likeness between the dead and the living but would not speak of it churl said dirk gazing into the half-closed gray eyes that resembled so his own he spoke as he saw me what did he say the headsman polished the mighty blade not to do with you or with any he answered the words had no meaning certes what were they whispered the youth have you come for me ursula then he said again ursula a quiver ran through dirk's frame she shall repent this the eastern witch he said wildly may the devil snatch you all to bitter judgment he turned to the captain with the head held against his breast what are you going to do with this his wife has asked for his head and his body that he may be buried befitting his estate his wife echoed dirk then slowly ay he had a wife and a son sir the child is dead dirk set the head down gently by the body and his lands he asked they go sir by favour of the empress to balthasar of courtreg who married as you may know this lord's heiress ursula dead now many years the snow had scattered the crowd the soldiers were impatient to be gone sir said the officer will you return with me to the palace and we will tell the empress how this mischance arose and how you came too late nay replied dirk fiercely take that good news alone he turned and descended the scaffold steps in a proud gloomy manner one of the soldiers held his horse he mounted in silence and rode away they who watched saw the thick snowflakes blot out the solitary figure and shuddered with no cause they understood end of section 20 recording by molly craig section 21 of black magic by marjorie bowen this LibriVox recording is in the public domain part 1 chapter 21 betrayed natalie stood at the door with a lantern in her hand dirk was returning the witch held up the light to catch a glimpse of his face then whispering and crying under her breath followed into the house there is blood on your shoes and on your breast she whispered when they reached the long chamber at the back dirk flung himself on a chair and moaned the snow lay still on his hair and on his shoulders he buried his face in the bend of his arm sir Doucht and his master have forsaken us whimpered the witch i could work no spells to-night and the mirror was blank dirk spoke in a muffled voice without raising his head of what use is magic to me i should have stayed in frankfurt natalie drew his wet cloak from his shoulders have i not warned you has not the brass head warned you that the young scholar will be your ruin bringing you to woe and misery and shame look at his blood on me cried dirk his blood balthasar and isabeau make merry with his lands but my hate shall mean something to them yet i should not have left frankfurt alas who was this man i did all i could whispered dirk the empress shall burn in hell the sickly creeping flames illuminated his pallid face and his small hand hanging clenched by his side this is an evil day for us moaned the witch the spirits will not answer the flames will not burn some horrible misfortune threatens dirk turned his gaze into the half-dark room 
where is thierry soon after you left he crept from his chamber and his face was evil he went into the street dirk paced up and down with uneven steps he will come back he must come back ah my heart you say zerdusht will not speak to-night the witch moaned and trembled over the fire nay nor will the spirits come dirk shook his clenched fist in the air they shall answer me he went to the window opened it and looked out into the blackness bring the lamp natalie obeyed the faint light showed the hastening snowflakes no more maybe they will listen to me nay as i say they shall the witch followed with the swinging lamp in her hand while they made their way in silence through the darkness and the snow in between the bare rose bushes over the wet cold earth until they reached the trap door at the end of the garden that led to the witch's kitchen here she paused while dirk raised the stone surely the earth shook then he said i felt it tremble beneath my feet hush there is a light below the witch peered over his shoulder and saw a faint glow rising from the open trap while at that moment her own lamp went suddenly out they stood in outer darkness will you dare descend muttered natalie what should i fear came the low wild answer and dirk put his foot on the ladder the witch followed they found themselves in the chamber and saw that it was lit by an immense fire seated before which was an enormous man with his back towards them he was dressed in black and at his feet lay stretched a huge black hound good even said dirk in a low voice the stranger turned a face as black as his garments round his neck he wore a collar of most brilliant red and purple stones a cold night he said and again it seemed as if the earth rumbled and shook you find our fire welcome answered dirk but the witch crouched against the wall muttering to herself a good heat a good heat said the blackamoor dirk crossed the room his arms folded on his breast his head erect what are you doing here he asked warming myself warming myself what have you to say to me the blackamoor drew closer to the fire ugh how cold it is he said and stuck out his legs and thrust them deep into the seething flames dirk drew still nearer if you be what i think you you have some reason in coming here i have been to the palace i have been to the palace i sat under the empress's chair while she talked to a pretty youth whose name is thierry aha it was cold in the palace there was snow on the youth's garments as there is blood on yours and the emperor was there thierry has betrayed me said the youth the blackamoor took his legs from the fire unscorched and untouched and the hellhound rose and howled he has betrayed you and isabeau accuses you to save herself but the devils are on your side since there is other work for you to do flee from frankfort and i will see that you fulfil your destiny and now he glanced over his shoulder the witch comes home to-night to-night the work here is done take the road through frankfort he stood up and his head touched the roof the gems on his throat gave out long rays of light the fire grew dim the blackamoor changed into a thick column of smoke that spread hell will not forsake you ursula of rousselary dirk fell back against the wall thick vapors encompassing him he put his hands over his face when he looked up again the room was clear and lit by the beams of the dying fire he gazed round for the witch but natalie had gone with a thick sob in his throat he sprang up the ladder into the outer air and rushed towards the desolate house desolate indeed empty dark and cold it stood the snow drifting in through the open windows the fires extinguished on the hearths 
a dead place never more to be inhabited. Dirk leant against the door, breathing hard. Here was a crisis of his fate, betrayed by one whom he loved, deserted, too, it seemed, since Natalie had disappeared. The blackamoor, he remembered him as a vision, a delusion, perhaps. Oh, how cold it was! Would his accusers come for him to-night? He crept to the gate that gave on to the street and listened. Out of the further darkness came a distant hurry and confusion of sound. Horses, shouting, eager feet, a populace roused, on the heels of the dealer in black magic, armed with fire and sword for the witches. Dirk opened the gate, for the last time stepped from the witch's garden. He wondered if Thierry was with the oncoming crowd, yet he did not think so. Probably he was in the palace. Probably he had repented already of what he had done. But the Empress had found her chance, her accusation falling first. Who would take his word against her? He listened to the noises of the approaching people, till through these another sound, nearer and stranger, made him turn his head. It came from the witch's house. Natalie, called Dirk in a half-hope. But the blackness rippled into fire. Swift flames sprang up. A column of gold and scarlet enveloped house and garden in a curling embrace. Dirk ran out into the road where the glare of the fire lit the swirling snow for a trembling circle. And shading his eyes he stared at the flames that consumed all his books, his magic herbs and potions, the strange things, rich and beautiful, that Natalie had gathered in her long evil life. Then he turned and ran down the street as the crowd surged in at the other end, to fall back upon one another aghast before the mighty flames that gave them mocking welcome. Their dismayed and angry shouts came to Dirk's ears as he ran through the snow. He fled the faster, towards the eastern gate. It was not yet shut. Light of foot and swift he darted through before they could challenge him, perhaps even before the careless guards saw him. He was a fine runner, not easily fatigued, but he had already strained his endurance to the utmost, and, after he had well cleared the city gates, his limbs failed him and he fell to a walk. After a while he saw, glimmering ahead of him, a light, it was neither in a house nor carried in the hand, for it shone low on the ground, lower, it seemed, to Dirk than his own feet. He paused, listened, and proceeded cautiously for fear of the river. That must lie, he thought, very close to his left. As he neared the light, he saw it to be a lantern that cast long rays across the clearing snowstorm. A glittering, trembling reflection beneath it told him it belonged to a boat roped to the bank. Dirk crept towards it, went on his knees in the snow and mud, and beheld a small, empty craft, the lantern hanging at the prow. He paused. The waters, rushing by steadily and angrily, must be flowing towards the Rhine and the town of Cologne. He stepped into the boat that rocked while the water splashed beneath him, but with cold hands he undid the knotted rope. The boat trembled a moment, then sped on with the current as if glad to be freed. An oar lay in the bottom, with which, for a while, Dirk helped himself along, fearful lest the owners of the boat should pursue. Then he let himself float downstream as he might. The water lapped about him, and the snow fell on his unprotected and already soaked figure. He stretched himself along the bottom of the boat and hid his face in the cushioned seats. His anguished tears, the cruel cold, the steady sound of the unseen water, exhausted and numbed him till he fell into a sleep that was half a swoon, while the boat drifted towards the town. When he awoke he was still in the open country. The snow had ceased, but lay on the ground thick and untouched to the horizon. Dirk found it ill to move, for his limbs were frozen, his clothes wet and clinging to his wincing flesh, while his eyes smarted with his late weeping. 
and his head was racked with giddy pains. For a while he sat, remembering yesterday, till his face hardened and darkened, and he set his pale lips and crawled painfully out of the boat, which had been caught in a clump of stiff withered reeds by the flat river bank. Before him was a sweep of snow leading to the forest, and as he gazed at this with dimmed, hopeless eyes, a figure in a white monk's habit emerged from the trees. He carried a rude wooden spade in his hand and walked with a slow step. He was coming towards the river, and Dirk waited. As the stranger neared, he lifted his eyes that had hitherto been cast on the ground, and Dirk recognized St. Ambrose of Menthon. Nevertheless, Dirk did not despair. Before the saint had recognized him, his part was resolved upon. Ambrose of Menthon gazed with pity and horror at the forlorn little figure shivering by the reeds. It was not strange that he did not at once know him. Dirk's face was of a ghastly hue. His eyes shadowed underneath, red and swollen, his lank hair clinging close to his small head, his clothes muddy, wet, and soiled, his figure bent. Sir, he said, and his voice was weak and sweet, have pity on an evil thing. He fell on his knees and clasped his hands on his breast. Rise up, answered the saint. What God has given me is yours, poor soul. Ye are very miserable. More miserable than ye wot of, said Dirk through chattering teeth, still on his knees. Do you not know me? Ambrose of Menthon looked at him closely. Alas, he murmured slowly, I know you. Dirk beat his breast. Mia culpa, he moaned. Mia culpa. Rise. Come with me, said the saint. I will attend your wants. The youth did not move. Will you solace my soul, sir? he cried. God must have sent you here to save my soul. For long days I have sought you. St. Ambrose's face glowed. Have ye, then, repented? Remorse and sorrow fill my heart, murmured Dirk. I have cast off my evil comrades, renounced my vile gains, and journeyed into the loneliness to find God his pardon, and it seemed he would not hear me. He hears all who come in grief and penitence, said the saint joyously, and he has heard you, for has he not sent me to find you, even in this most desolate place? You feed me with hope, answered Dirk in a quivering voice, and revive me with glad tidings. May I dare, I, poor lost wretch, to be uplifted and exalted? Poor youth, was the tender murmur. Come with me. He led the way across the thick snow, Dirk following with downcast eyes and white cheeks. They skirted the forest and came upon a little hut set back and sheltered among the scattered trees. St. Ambrose opened the rude door. I am alone now, he said softly as he entered. I had with me a frail, holy youth who was traveling to Paris. Last night he died. I have just laid his body in the earth. His soul rests on the bosom of the Lord. Dirk stepped into the hut and stood meekly on the threshold, and St. Ambrose glanced at him wistfully. Maybe God has sent me this soul to tend and succor in place of that he has called home. Dirk whimpered humbly. If I might think so. The saint opened an inner door. Your garments are wet and soiled. A sudden color stained Dirk's face. I have no others. Ambrose of Menthon pointed to the inner chamber. There Blay died yestereve. There are his clothes. Enter and put them on. It will be the habit of a novice? asked Dirk softly. Yea. Dirk bent and kissed the saint's fingers with ice-cold lips. I have dared, he whispered, to hope that I might die wearing the garb of God his servants, and now I dare even to hope that he shall grant my prayer. He stepped into the inner chamber and closed the door. 
End of section 21. Recording by Molly Craig.